Conservative leader Pierre Poiliev pictured here asking members of his caucus if anybody wants a back rub. It's very relaxing. Anyways, he is losing it. More than usual. You see, this week he was at a caucus retreat, and he took his fear-mongering to a whole new level. So on his Sunday morning speech to the Conservative caucus, his attempt to rally the troops, he warned that the coming increase to the carbon price would lead to a, quote, nuclear winter for the economy. He said, quote, there would be mass hunger and malnutrition with a tax this high. Our seniors would have to turn the heat down to 14 or 13 C just to make it through the winter. Inflation would run rampant and people would not be able to leave their homes or drive anywhere. So all this fear-mongering, this is about the coming increase to the carbon price, which is going to add up to about 16 cents a liter on gas. And in his mind, a 16 cents a liter gas price increase is going to lead to Armageddon. Nuclear winter. The whole thing collapses because of the carbon tax. This is nuts. Who actually believes this? Gas is nearly three bucks Canadian a liter in the UK. And they're having trouble, but there certainly hasn't been nuclear winter. Like, this is absolutely ridiculous. This is not a man who takes his job seriously. He is singularly focused on one and only one thing. Getting people good and scared. Because apparently a small increase to the price of gas that you get refunded back to you is enough to collapse everything. It's Mad Max times out here. Because the carbon tax increased slightly. This guy wants to run the country. He can't even run a meeting without freaking out about the carbon tax. Whenever politicians say things like axe the tax, they always act like there's no cost in doing so. Like a carbon tax is expensive and not having any sort of climate action is free. But this week Nova Scotia is giving us a strong reminder that that is not the case. So specifically this is about the Chignecto Isthmus. And if you've never heard of that, you're probably not from the Maritimes. This is the only strip of land that connects Nova Scotia to the rest of the country. And it's less than 20 miles long. It is not big. But it's also a low-lying area, which means it's in significant risk from climate change. Rising sea levels could be enough to eliminate this isthmus and separate Nova Scotia from the rest of the country. And it sees $100 million of trade every day and $35 billion of trade a year. And there's a serious risk that this could just be washed away. So now we're in a position where the Nova Scotia government and the federal government are fighting over who needs to pay for the mitigation measures. And they're going to cost a lot of money. And the costs are a little unclear just yet, but it's going to be significant. Problem is, as is always the case with governments, they're trying to use it to get extra money too. Like somehow protecting the isthmus is going to require a new seawall along the Halifax waterfront. Because if you're not asking for extra federal funding, what the point, really? So here's my question. Will axing the tax make this better or worse? Will getting rid of any climate plan that Canada has make this better or worse? Like, we can't keep treating not doing anything about the climate as being cost neutral. Like, this is going to be a massive infrastructure project that's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars that didn't need to happen. Like, there were no issues here for hundreds of years. Then climate change kicks in, and here we are. But there's going to be folks who keep pretending it's nothing, obviously. They're just looking forward to new oceanfront property in Saskatchewan. I've got a quick question for Canadians. If you wanted to go get a COVID vaccine today, where would you go? And it's kind of a problem, because in most provinces, the answer is nowhere. Because the Public Health Agency of Canada directed provinces to get rid of their existing COVID-19 vaccines before the rollout of the new ones. And the rollout of the new ones has been a mess. So the new round of COVID-19 vaccines that target the currently circulating variants have already been approved in the United States. They were approved on August 22nd. Still no luck in Canada. But not only that, you can't get the old ones either. And the reason why is even more ridiculous than you think. So the old vaccines had a drug identification number attached to them. So do the new vaccines. And for some reason, the Public Health Agency of Canada assigned them the same number. And because they have the same drug identification number, they can't both be in the same pharmacy at the same time. So they just threw out the old ones. Instead of, oh, I don't know, having two numbers. There were so many numbers. Have you tried counting? Now, the reason why they claim that they've done this is because if they created a new drug identification number, they would have to go through a longer approval process. But they're the ones who created the approval process. So they could just change that. But they didn't. Instead, there's just basically no access to vaccines in Canada for the better part of a month. So essentially, we have to wait longer as a country to get our COVID-19 vaccines because our government can't count. They have a lot of trouble with numbers.
Ontario Premier Doug Ford, pictured here after eating ice cream too quickly, has another reason to have a headache. Because the Ontario Financial Accountability Office is now investigating his expansion of alcohol in corner stores. I'm sure they won't find anything dubious. Even though the Ford government paid almost a quarter billion dollars out of pocket and is giving up way more revenues than that. And why? I don't know, beer at corner stores. It was gonna happen anyways, but we paid a quarter billion dollars to make it happen faster. It was already gonna end up in corner stores at the end of 2025. So why hurry? Who knows? But the Financial Accountability Office is going to look into it. So specifically, they're estimating the costs and benefits of the expansion and compare them to the fiscal impacts of a scenario where they didn't expand the access until the end of the 2025 contract. And I'm sure the government's very confident because Finance Minister Peter Bethlenfall V said, quote, there's always going to be costs, but that every nickel we're going to make sure it's accounted for. Sure hope so, because you're going to have to open the books. Although he seemed a little less confident on July 8th when Bethlehem Folly was asked whether or not this would affect the revenue stream, and his answer was, who knows? Very reassuring. He said, quote, it depends on how consumer behavior is. We'll see how everything plays out, and then I'll let you know. But now he says, quote, revenues will grow above current levels. Okay, wh why? How? Magic? And this investigation's targeted to be completed in early 2025. But it's gonna need cooperation from the government in order to do so. I'm sure that'll totally happen. Doug Ford's known for his cooperative nature, especially when he's being investigated, which happens a lot. It's time for your daily reminder of just how bonkers the Canadian Conservative Party has become. This time, it's about their Director of Communications, Sarah Fisher. Really, it's more about her side hustle. You see, she's got a little website she contributes to. It's called Elect Conservatives. And before you come saying that she's not on there, she's one of the three people listed on their website. And for the most part, it's just like hyper-conservative blog posts. Pretty much what you would expect. But I want to take a moment to take you through the merch, because it is wild. Like this I'm Smarter Than the Prime Minister t-shirt, written in what appears to be Comic Sans. The fact that it's grammatically incorrect doesn't really help their case. Capital letters are important. They're selling a whole line of shirts calling Justin Trudeau Castro Jr., which, we're not doing that again, it's a debunked conspiracy theory. Justin Trudeau's mother hadn't even met Fidel Castro until years after he was born. If you believe that, you're just falling for propaganda. We're not arguing. Got a t-shirt calling Justin Trudeau a tyrant, and another calling him the Jack of Asses. They sell that logo in about 35 different shirts. They're big fans. They were very proud of themselves that day. Like, just everywhere. You want a tumbler? You got it. Or how about a No Vaccine Passports tapestry? A this mask is as useless as Justin Trudeau mask, I love Canadian oil hoodies, this very unhinged stand on guard for the shirt with a picture of a gun. Although by far the weirdest is that they sell an entire line of clothing based on this photo of Krista Freeland's legs. Like, what the hell is this? Who is this for? Who needs a Krista Freeland's legs shower curtain? These are not the purchases of someone in a healthy mental state. Or their keep on trucking in the free world hoodies. Or my personal favorite, without a breath of irony, my rights don't end where your feelings begin. Do you think that applies to trans people? Or is it just wanting to throw a tantrum in downtown Ottawa? But yeah, this isn't normal. Like, they're selling pillows that say, when the government fears the people, there is liberty. Like, who thinks, let's dress up the living room with a, when the government fears the people, there is liberty throw pillow. Really zhuzh it up. But this is a website where the comms director of the Conservative Party of Canada is a contributor. We good with this? Like, do you really think that this is part of a healthy political discourse? This? Really? Canadian conservative governments have a bit of a problem. You see, the things that they want to do are wildly unpopular. And so the only way that they can get the public on board is by just lying. Like Alberta Health Minister Adriana Lagrange did. So the Alberta government's looking at potentially moving some of its hospitals to a Catholic healthcare provider called Covenant Health and Covenant Health would not be providing abortion services. Now, Adriana LaGrange claimed that that would be fine, wouldn't change anything. On September 3rd, she claimed there is no anticipated change to access to women's reproductive health. She insisted that this will not be a change because, quote, right now no hospital in Alberta performs elective abortions. Thing is, that's not true. It's just an outright lie. We know that more than half of abortions in Alberta are performed through surgical procedures. Where does she think they're performed? And then LaGrange said that this was in fact referring to elective surgical abortions, which are performed in clinics in Edmonton and Calgary. But that's not what she said. She said abortions. 
and the hospitals offer medication-based abortions. So it's not that she was lying, she was just referring to a completely different thing that she didn't say. So long as you believe that, it's probably fine. And she is lying. The Alberta government is working to reduce access to reproductive care, and they're lying to your face about it. Like, genuine question, why are conservative supporters so eager to be lied to? They do this every day. I make a dozen videos daily breaking down conservative lies, and still there are people who believe them. This person was talking about the potential of back-to-work legislation and said that in those cases, workers can just quit. Literally just quit. Mass walk-off. And they're right that that's technically possible, but the systems in Canada have been set up to make it borderline impossible. Like, if you walk off the job, you can't collect EI. Like generally, if you voluntarily leave your job, you don't qualify for employment insurance. Very likely, you get your health benefits through your workplace. That's how you pay your bills. Like there are a bunch of ways that people get trapped in their workplaces. And because we connect so many different services to your work, and we cut those services as soon as you're not working, it's very difficult to do this, especially en masse. Like those workers have responsibilities, they have families. And this is why I genuinely think that universal basic income is a huge part of building worker power. A lot easier to walk off when you can still pay the bills. A lot easier to maintain a protracted strike when you're getting an income. Because yeah, you could technically just quit, but it's never quite that simple. And so we need to address those systemic traps that are holding workers down, limiting worker power and mobility. So this is one of my favorite things that happens on here. People don't have any nuance to their understanding of an issue, and then attach that to me. This person is claiming that I think that taxes will change the temperature. Okay, I need you to know nobody thinks that. If you think that, it's because you don't understand the carbon tax even a little bit. It's not how it's meant to work. It's meant to reduce the carbon that enters the atmosphere to help mitigate our contributions to climate change. It's to stop the temperature increasing more. Like, do you think people genuinely believe they pay a tax and the thermometer goes down? Is that genuinely how you understand the carbon tax? Because if so, there are far deeper issues here. And this is really what it comes down to. There's a whole bunch of conservatives out there who are just deeply incurious. They have no desire to understand it. They have no desire to understand why the carbon tax is there or what it's for. They just think, taxes don't change temperature! And get angry without any understanding. Like, dude, all you've done here is loudly announce you have no earthly idea what you're talking about. Read a book. I think this person's pointing at something really important. The amount of conservatives who are taking it on faith that prices will magically fall if we axe the carbon tax is wild. Because think about how you pay the carbon tax. In most cases, you don't have like a separate line on your receipt that says carbon tax. It's priced into stuff. It's priced in the costs of producing things. It's priced into the cost of gas at the pump. All that stuff. There are a few exceptions where it's listed separately, like home heating, but in most cases, it's priced in. So if the carbon tax was eliminated, the only way that those prices would go down is if the companies that set the prices pass those savings along to consumers. If the companies lower their prices instead of pocketing the savings. And if people believe that, they must be new at this whole companies thing. Like, what reason is there for anybody to believe that prices would ever actually go down? It would rely on the generosity of companies to, instead of pocketing that money and giving it to themselves and their shareholders, giving it to consumers. And if anybody believes that's going to happen, they haven't really been paying attention. Pretty clear trends. So this person saw that a major corridor between Nova Scotia and the rest of the country is under threat. And it's going to take a major infrastructure project to protect it. And this person said, how adorable. You have a problem? Give your earnings to the government. Have a headache? Government. Sleep at night? Wake up in the morning? Give money to the government. Okay, so here's the thing. Libertarians are exhausting for so many reasons. For starters, if you want a libertarian to shut up, just ask them their opinions on the age of consent. They tend to clam up in a real hurry. But also, if you're one of these no-government people, what's your plan for infrastructure? Like, $35 billion a year worth of trade goes through that corridor. Once it's gone, then what? Who eats that cost? Like, do you think the community's just gonna organize itself together and take on a multi-billion dollar infrastructure project? Just rugged self-sufficiency? Like, come on. Friendly reminder, libertarians are like house cats. Completely dependent on everyone around them, but convinced they're independent. And they proudly brag about it all the time. There's, there's no way. Just every part of this comment, it's, it's a symphony. So this person was whining about the carbon tax, 
and said, quote, So are you saying that the Barron Strait that used to connect Russia to what's now Alsaska could have been fixed by taxing the people from then as well? Can't wait to see that taught in schools, lol. Okay, not the Barron Strait, the Bering Strait. But also, you understand that the Bering Land Bridge disappeared thousands of years ago, right? Like, what's your plan here? Like, to institute taxation on societies that didn't have money? Like, do you think that the indigenous pre-contact societies in North America were contributing to climate change? You must be new here. Like, come on, man. Do you feel silly when you write this? Like, do you write this and you think, yeah, that'll show him. Like, you must know what you're doing here, right? Like, you wrote Alsaska and Baron Strait. Come on, man. Sixty percent of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense.